Can I have everybody please rise for the flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for us. At this time, can I ask for a motion to accept the January 9th agenda? No motion. That's Christy. Can I get a second? All in favor? Okay. At this time, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence for the um, for Donna Wells. Uh, she um, passed away, um, and she retired from the district on June of 2011 after 23 years of service. Also to Ed Luke, a teacher at A. Cole, who retired on June 30th of 2009 after 29.9 years. Um, they'll both be greatly missed. I just have a moment. Thank you. Um, at this time, we're going to move on to item C, which is community open forum. Probably have anything? No? Okay, we'll move on to item D, which is the budget presentation. At this time, I'd like to um, turn it over to Maureen. Projections is actually we have a district policy. I'm trying to put these things together for you guys because I don't want auditors to be asking you. It's um, 5570 financial accountability, and it says that the district has long term three to five year financial plans. We do three years, um, and all of them every year are on the website, so you can go back and see them for the last three or four years, and they're pretty much consecutive after each other. And the Comptroller's Office also calls for multi-year financial planning. It's a tool for local governments. Um, it's only required for cities and counties, but it's considered a best practice But for school districts. But if, when you guys go to your financial um, trainings, they definitely tell you that there should be long-range planning. And if you have long-range planning, it's required to be on your website, and it is on our website. So basically, we use this tool, and the one that I use is from the Comptroller's Office itself. Um, and it makes us start with what we currently know regarding our district and explore trends and then put revenues and expenditure estimates towards it. So this is our actual, the close of June 30th of this year, the 21-22 actual numbers. The revenues are basically state aid, the tax levy are the bulk of our revenues. We did have a large appropriated fund balance used this year, and we had some other expenditures there. I wanted to point out, um, so the expenditures were greater than the revenues by 1.3 million last year at the close. The reason that it's 4.5 million is because we appropriated the 3.2 million to the capital project that was also voted on in May of last year. Our expenditures, are basically our um, object codes that are required, salaries, fringe benefits, and we have both these services, debt service, other expenditures, and we pull out utilities and fuel. As we look at these things with our historical trends, we basically get the bulk of our revenues from state aid, which you can see here in the pie chart, and the rest of it from the tax levy. We have very little, if any, revenue coming from any other sources. We can apply fund balance, and we do get small pieces of revenue, but the significant ones are state aid in the tax levy. The same with the expenditure side. The salaries and the fringe benefits are pretty much the bulk of our expenditures, so those are the big driving forces. So basically, almost two-thirds 
of our expenditures are the people. They're definitely a service district. This is the budget that we're currently in. Basically the same setup as far as um, percentages of expenditure. It's a 3% increase over the budget that we closed the year before. And if you put it in the pie formats, you can see the same trends. State aid being a, the largest revenue source, followed by the tax levy. And on the expenditure side, the salaries and benefits making up the bulk of our expenditures. This is the I guess you would call it the spreadsheet that's used to, to do the long-range planning. You basically place your numbers. Those, these are the same numbers that we just looked at. The budget from 21-22 against the actual from 21-22, and then lay down the current budget that we're in. And you, based on assumptions and items that you know or don't know, you push those numbers forward. What do we know? So we do know next year that um, they're projecting the TRS system to go down slightly, the ERS system to project an increase slightly, and gen in general health insurance on average goes up about 7% a year. Those are definitely a couple of big driving factors in our budget. So this is the set of assumptions that we're using to make the projections. We're gonna do two scenarios, and basically, it's a huge spreadsheet, and I go through it and change things and move them around, but I try to do these two scenarios, and the only thing that's changing is the state aid. The first one is a 3% state aid increase, and the second one is a 5% state aid increase. Across all, all of it, I'm using a 2% tax levy increase, which is basically um, the tax cap regulation. We're appropriating 1.5 million of fund balance, and that's what we have this year in our budget, and so that's a no change. And the same with the all other revenues, no changes. Payroll and projected 4% across the three years. The ERS, TRS, and health insurance, I pulled those out separately based on what we just discussed. So ERS would be a zero, TRS is a 2%, and then we're moving that forward, and the 7% on the health insurances. OC's 3%. The debt service, we act, I actually have an attached schedule that's in there because we know what our payments are that currently stand. And then everything else we're putting 3% to, just like the BOCES. Because basically what you want to do is touch the big categories and not really and highlight the big, chain, the big swing items, but you don't want to get involved in all the little pieces because it's just a projection. So at 3%, state aid increase with a 2% levy increase, if you push those forward, using the expenditure um, projections that we had there in the assumptions page, next year we're a little short, million three, and then it just um, amplifies from there, 2.5, 4 million. If you look at the budget increases, they're for a little over 4%. The second year, the 24-25, actually I, should, I didn't point out something back on the assumptions, hold on. If you look at year two on the state aid, I'm taking $775,000 out of there in the second year because I know that the building aid that's corresponding to debt service is going down. So that's why when you, when you push that forward, um, the second year has a budget increase that's just under 3%. So I specifically picked 5%, which is the next present, or the next projection because this is basically, if we had 5% coming in state aid, if you look at the bottom, that's a doable scenario. We could adjust that and get into the numbers that we would need mo moving forward. So I'm, I'm basically plugging these two projections in there. We could do all sorts of scenarios all over the place. But basically, we're looking for and would love to have a 5% state aid increase. That's what would get us in our game. Some of these items you can see in our forecast five data. You can pull these out, and I think some of this stuff is interesting. I just like to show it to you. These are the districts in our county. Um, just our basic facts. We have the highest district enrollment. 
And our combined wealth ratio is a 0.55, which if you look at it is one of the higher ones in the county. That is basically the combined wealth ratio. State average is one. So everybody is lower than the state average. But as far as our county goes, we are a little bit wealthier than the rest of our county, um, except for Sandy Creek and Mexico. But if you look at the, um, the low income percentage, that's the free and reduced lunch percentage. Ours is the lowest, which is one of the factors that causes us to not be able to participate and not be considered a high needs district. This is just a, a look at our enrollment. That's the, the gray bar. As you can see, it's been going down slightly, and now it's starting to moderate, which is interesting because when we had those studies done, it was probably 15 years ago now. They said it would be decline until right about now, and then it would stabilize, and that really seems to be happening. The blue line is our um, disability status, which has basically remained fairly constant, and the orange line is our free and reduced lunch economic status, which also has not fluctuated a ton. This graph is revenues, and I wanted to, I pulled this out because we want, we talk about our revenue, the orange, Central Square is all the way to the left. So the orange is state aid, the blue is tax levy. Everything else is so small that it isn't even, doesn't really show on the bar. So we get the bulk of our funds from state aid. The one next to it is the average for the state. The state, on the average, the state only gets 37% of their revenues from state aid and 61% and from the tax levy. So it's very, so districts like us that have such a higher percentage of state aid as our revenue source are very dependent on what happens with that legislature every year and with those runs. The two graphs on the, um, the other side are basically putting that same information into a per pupil expenditure. So on the revenue side, our per pupil expenditure is about 22.7 thousand, which is less than the state total of 27.7 thousand. This is the same scenario with expenditures. And again, Central Square is here all the way to the left. The light blue or the teal is salaries, and the purple, or I'm sorry, is benefits, and the purple is salaries, and the red is everything else. So again, salaries and benefits make up the bulk of the expenditures. And this is the same across all districts. If you look at the state, we're very close to what the state average is. And the other two graphs are just putting that in perspective of a per pupil expenditure. So the expenditures around 20,200 per pupil um, versus the state average about 24.7 thousand. This is basically the same graph, the expenditure per pupil, um, but by the counties, by the districts in our county. So as a whole, Central Square spends the least per pupil, which a lot of it is just because our denominator is so high because of the, the number of students that we have in our district. These are, um, again, just trend lines showing that our revenues, the green, have, have gone up, expenditures go up accordingly, and down in the bottom is our fund balance. And you can see in the last few years, as we know, our fund balance has been increasing. This is fund balance by all the different categories. We know that in 21, we were very high and we intentionally left it there. And now we've been using um, various ways to bring it down over the last couple years. And I like this graph to put that in perspective. That looks like we have a lot of fund balance, but these, here's all the districts in our county, and we're down there at the close to the least amount of fund balance.
compared to other districts, even in our county. So this is kind of a kickoff of starting the budget process. Generally, sometime this month, the executive budget will be released, and that's when we will make decisions based on what those state aid percentages are. Whatever, if 5% or something in that realm would come, that would be the dream, and we would really just have a nice budget process for this year. February and March, those two months we're gonna use for budget development. Based on what happens with um, state aid, we'll make fund balance decisions, we'll make tax levy decisions, and we'll do some planning for the end of the, um, at the end of next year, 24-25, the education stimulation funding, the, the, the money's gonna run out. So we have a lot of things right now that are being paid for out of that, and we're gonna have to work towards whether we wanna keep them and pull them into the budget or whether they've accomplished the goal and we can be done with them. Then when we get to the April board meeting, we'll have to adopt a budget, and then May will kick off the district vote and put in all the process that put that through. One little caveat, and I said this to Tom, there's rumors that possibly we aren't getting um, revenue until February, Tom? That's what Chris Todd said. Yeah, and if that were to happen, and I don't have February to do probably two or three budget presentations to push us forward, we potentially could have to done, have another meeting there because we, we really need to know our starting point before we can start pushing forward decisions and deciding what we want to and do. And we said that. that when we decided to go to one board meeting a yeah. month, if, if the governor put out a late budget and we had to have an emergency board meeting, we would. Yeah, yeah, we would. But I'll try to put as many of the items together as we can for February and March. It, basically, I, I'm thinking if I do like three each, we should be good to adopt a budget in April. Does anybody have any questions? It's kind of shooting in the dark until he puts his runs out. So. Exactly. But the, the rumor is that, well, the plan was with local that foundation aid was going to be made whole by the end of this year. So there was some fairly large increases last year. And given the inflation, inflation is in that calculation, so we could potentially get a decent number. There's, there is some hope there. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to item B, um, personnel. Um, can I get a motion to accept personnel? I'll motion. Christy? I'll second. Chance? All in favor? Vote? No. Abstain. Okay, one abstain. Item F, consent agenda. Can I get a motion to accept the consent agenda? I'll second. Mrs. Wood and Mrs. Fishman. All in favor? Yes. Item G, start off with Mr. Stevens. Do you have anything for us on this evening? Uh, yes, I do. <clears throat> uh, tonight I just wanted to provide an update in regards to student government and the efforts regarding substance use, mental health, and suicide prevention. Uh, student government is currently working on numerous activities, events, and initiatives to support the well-being of our students. We're opening discussions with the Prevention Coalition in regards to a DWI awareness event of some sort. Uh, we're looking at ways to promote social-emotional learning. We have had and are planning events to increase transparency between all the counselor, counseling personnel and students because it's crucial that students see the faces of who they can go to with whatever their situation is. We're doing this because we understand that Oswego County is in the middle, uh, has a higher suicide rate than around half the state. And we understand that we have a significantly higher opioid death rate than the state average. So we're just trying to do our part. Our part is supporting one another. And it's to lead by example, not just to say, but to truly show and live and exemplify what it means as, as when we rise, together we soar. And that's a bit of what we're uh, gonna keep doing and supporting our students and their well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Um, board members, any reports from any board members? I do not have anything going on. Anybody else? Yes, Allison. So I'd like to um, brag a little. I'm pretty proud that our Township Square Red Hawks went to a pretty large tournament. 
then on Saturday and we played first among 13 teams. What score in the wrestling? Uh, for wrestling. Uh, sorry, that's <coughs> all so long day. Um, but we have a 150 point lead over everybody else. And last year we played fourth. So it's nice to kind of see the contrast of where the kids have came, you know, moving up three spots. But um, I was pretty proud to see this year. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I just wanted to add or ask Pearl. I'd like to get an updated attendance record for all the board members based on some of the um, referendum stuff that we've kind of been talking about. So I'd like an updated attendance record so we can look at that. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Calamuto for his superintendent's report. Okay. I'll start off just. Uh, Piggybacking what else Douglas said, I went to the um, the Dixon tournament. It's one of the big the big tournament on Saturday. It was very well attended, um, and our our student athletes were phenomenal. The following students earned seats <clears throat> in their respective all county honors ensemble based on their auditions. All county honors mixed chorus: Samantha Cook, Faith Hopnick, Abigail Nowak, Sydney Saunders, Logan Reynolds, and Elliot White. All County Honors Band. Fun fact, Central Square has the largest number of student representation in the county for the SH All County Band. Sophia R. Curry, Campbell Bagley, um, Olivia Cornell, Megan Alderbroom, Avery Ford, Jocelyn Georges, Ashley Haskell, Susanna Hip, Sarah Hulbert, Nicholas Lennox, Kyle McCaster, sorry, Kyle McAllister, Gabriella Rabia, Nicole Real, uh, Landon Stevens, Nina Stalsenberg, Abigail Sundet, and Teresa Tancredi. Paul V. Moore Vocal Jazz Ensemble, Syracuse Airport Performance. On December 20, the Paul V. Moore High School Vocal Jazz Ensemble went on the road and performed in the Syracuse Airport Terminal for the listening pleasure of travelers who were passing by. It was great to see how the students brought smiles to the faces of so many who passed by and caused a number to just pause and take some photos. Uh, and I, I actually saw other administrators were posting this on Twitter and it was, it was another opportunity for our students to shine. Junior um, High All-County Honors Band. Fun fact, Central Square, is this the second fun fact, huh? Is it? Yes, it is. Fun fact, Central Square has the largest student representation of any other district in the county for the JH All Junior High School All County Band. Eighth grade, Amelia Gill, Isabella Sanford, Sabrina Briggs, Jackson Stevens, Chloe Rafe, Raven Wheeler, Madigan Murphy, seventh grade, um, Christiana. Jerolman, Caitlin Gilbert, Olivia Everson, Nathan Downey, Marilyn Poole, Daniel Flynn, Mason Hunter, Colton Allen, Andrew George, Mackenzie Mundy, um, Shanette Alston, Emerson Wolfenden, Liam Hunter, and Haley Gopel. Paul D. Moore DECA team, first place. Riley Dunn, Tia Pasalequa, Brandon Chapman, Matt Bonk, George Curry, Maddox Ramsey, Nathaniel Moody, Kenzie Rumo, Nathan Orchinski, Cameron Hunt, Ariana Smolin, Emma Bonk, second place, Patrick Johns, Colin Lacey, Ava Bateman, Christian Morrow, Abigail Tetral, Brianna Rabrowski, Maya Howard, Ariana Fenton, Audrey Teltrot, Avery Sheehan, third place, Austin Logan, Olivia Ruzikovich, Sarah Holbert, Avery Maraglia, Brandon Wolf, Anna Wheeler, James Farley, fourth place. Julia Kleingard, 
Kind Gardner, um, Non Fan, Maria Tolson, Zachary Card, Gabrielle Brown, and Dylan Myers. Also, Abigail Tetrot was elected president for Region 9 DECA, and Summer Fetter was elected vice president. Rachel Fleischman was also elected vice president of leadership. Great job to all. Central Square Middle School DECA team, newly formed using resources under the ESSA and CESA improvement plan, attended their first uh, ever competition. There were 10 schools in attendance and about 300 DECA members. Congratulations to nine students from the middle school who participated. And in their first year, congratulations to um, Chloe Gibbs, who won first place in her event. I went down to the middle school today um, in Mr. Penrod's office. We called her down and uh, congratulated her. And I explained that when she gets up to the high school, she's just going to do wonderful things, especially with all of the DECA scholarships and whatnot. But we were very impressed with Chloe. Um, our own Matthew Stevens, sitting right over there, senior at Paul B. Moore High School, was recently selected to represent New York State as a delegate to the United States Senate Youth Program. Each year, two of the highest achieving students from each state, the District of Columbia and the Department of Defense Education System overseas, are selected through a merit-based selection process. Matthew Stevens was one of the two students selected in New York State this year. This is an amazing accomplishment. In addition to attending the United States Senate Youth Program in person later this year, Matthew will also receive a scholarship in the amount of $10,000. Congratulations, Matthew. <laughs> two quick things. Um, on Wednesday, I'll actually have Aaron Phillips filling in for me for the Superintendent Parent Council Group because I will be up all evening at Lemoyne College um, with Micron repre uh, representatives along with several other superintendents, very similar to what we did last month with OCC. And the goal in that is to learn um, exactly what we need to do to make our students ready, whether they go um, from here onto OCC and they go the pathway um, of the, you know, to possibly work at Micron um, with microchips, but also our teachers that are teaching courses that are very close to being able to be counted as credit in that pathway at OCC and what we need to do there. Um, but then also this one with Lemoyne, very similar. Not only for that, to, to, so if students want to be able to then go to Lemoyne College, what are some of the courses that we could offer here? But also, right now, Micron is only committed to Liverpool and North Syracuse regarding um, summer enrichment programs, and they now are interested in, in talking with us. Um, at Central Square and Phoenix are very close to where the plant will be, and I just want to do everything that, that I can as superintendent leading this district to make sure that all of those wonderful opportunities will also be presented to uh, our Central Square students. So again, it plays right into the pathways and the conversations that we've been having, so that's very exciting. And lastly, on February 16th, which is a Thursday, we looked at the district calendar and we looked at Hastings Mallory Elementary calendar and it looks to work the best. It'd be right before break. <clears throat> Friday is the last day before break. But we're looking to have a community forum at 6 p.m. in the Hastings Mallory Elementary School, or cafeteria, where we can really lay out what the 2023-2024 school year will look like for the staff and the students of Hastings Mallory Elementary to be housed at uh, Central Square Intermediate School, CSI, for that school year. And again, we'll start out talking about um, by utilizing CSI as the swing space, which is this, has been this board's plan all along in this whole process of capital projects because it drastically reduces the duration um, and the cost for many reasons. One, when you put it out to bid, the, comp the, the construction companies right now, they are in the driver's seat because they will literally allow them only take on bids where it is the easiest and the cleanest for them to do. Doing third shifts where they have to clean everything up and have it ready and presentable and suitable to teach in those classrooms is very difficult. And they'll just, they'd rather take on um, a, a large job where they can shut a building down. So we're very fortunate to be able to have CSI to be able to do that. We're going to give a little bit of a presentation, and then we'll have our entire leadership staff to be able to answer any questions. 
Amy Caitlin will be able to talk about food services, and we're not going to skip a beat there. Um, uh, John Pierce will be able to answer any questions regarding transportation. Aaron will be able to answer instructional things on Kristen Enright. Uh, Kira Critzy, obviously, as building principal, will be there. Um, we will, uh, Chrissy Smith will be there for special education, and Rain will be there for technology. The goal is to make this as seamless as possible. Luckily, we've already kind of you know, done this already with Miller Hawk, and uh, there was colossal savings in, in utilizing that building as a swing space. I will tell you right now, every district that I know are, are, are involved in a capital project, and unfortunately, there are some that have to bus students um, very far out of their district because they don't have the swing space. Fortunately, we do. Um, the following school year, 24-25, we will see uh, AA Cole, and that gives us the rest of this year and all next year to give a plan for that, and we'll do a very similar thing. We'll, we'll go over to AA Cole, and we'll explain all of this. Again, utilizing uh, CSI. And if, if you haven't been down to CSI and any board member wants to, I'm more than happy to show you around. Aaron and Paul Versett spent a lot of time, and Chrissy Smith has, got, has been down there walking to make, uh, each classroom to make sure, and we have everything that we need um, for Miller Hawk, we'll have everything that we need, I'm sorry, for Hastings, and we have everything we need for AA Cole. But if you haven't seen the building, the building, I thought it was in pretty good shape when we were down there, when I was kind of overseeing it during the Miller Hawk renovation process. But it is so much better right now than it was before. With the site work outside, the concrete, all that's fixed, the locked-in vestibule area, and a lot of other improvements that have been able to take place throughout the capital project um, transition. So we're, we're thrilled. And that whole, I don't know, we could get two people, we could get 100 people that show up. But whoever shows up, even if it's two people, I want them to feel very comfortable that we're putting a lot of planning into this. We are always talking about it in cabinet meetings and in our planning sessions because we want it to be as smooth as possible and we really feel we'll be able to do that. So we're excited about that and uh, thus ends my superintendent report. Thank you, sir. Um, at this time, I'd like to take item H in its entirety and I got a motion to accept that. Mrs. Wood? A second? Chance? All in favor? Okay. That's unanimous. And I am I. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So motion. Christy? Okay. And a second? Chance? All in favor? Okay. Have a wonderful evening, everybody.